But at the same time, is this situation happening? Yes, a lot. Matter of fact, like I said, a lot of the acid burn victims, it's not actually the family that's doing it. It's the guy that got rejected who's mad that he doesn't want this girl to have anybody else, so he's going to go dump acid on her so no, she's not desirable for anyone else. That's why I said we have an issue. How do we solve it? We've got to work together. Oh, go ahead. Oh. <laughs> no, oh, okay. Sorry. Okay, uh, two things I thought you might be interested in. Um, several months ago, I think it was about March or April, mm -hmm. again at Rollins College, there was a program, uh, the Multicultural uh, group of, of students, and they showed a rather anodyne uh, film on uh, Islam. And then after, they had invited a, an imam uh, to uh, answer questions. And uh, there were several really pointed questions. He did not answer any of them. No. He went around, around, around. Absolutely. And I was with a uh, professor of political science uh, at UCF, and he said to me, I am almost positive that this is the same imam with whom I spoke three days after 9-11 who said, you know who did it? It was the Jews. Absolutely. So that's the first thing. The second thing yeah. was I heard on NPR this morning to, to pick up on what this uh, woman said about uh, uh, moderate Muslims, because I think it's important, very important, to make a distinction between that and the radicals. Uh, Hassan uh, Shalgoumi is the rector and the imam uh, of Drancy in Paris. And uh, he recently wrote a book. Uh, I only have the title in English. Uh, do you have it in French? Mm, uh, no. uh, in English, the book is called An Islam for France. Um, he uh, um, is in agreement with President Sarkozy uh, against the burqa. And he is the head imam in Paris. Uh, because of this, he received death threats. Now he has uh, bodyguards all the time, mm -hmm. and he said that um, the moderate um, the moderate Muslims are very frightened. An average mo moderate Muslim cannot have bodyguards. So what happens? Um, of the fifteen hundred uh, Muslim uh, uh, imams in France, very very few were born in France, right. uh, and that is a big problem. Uh, because, as you may remember, in 1979, which was a seminal year, that was when uh, the hostages were taken, when the Shah was kicked out, mm -hmm. and when uh, Khomeini uh, came in, uh, and that was also something that a lot of people don't know, is the siege of Mecca. Uh, when the right-wing uh, uh, Muslims seized the, the, the uh, mosque in Mecca, and the Saudi, uh, Saudi family was absolutely, they didn't know what to do. They called in the Americans, they couldn't do anything. So they decided they were going to have a big uh, meeting with the imams to uh, say that what these radicals were uh, claiming uh, was a, a false Islam. And they had their meeting, and the imam said, well, actually, they're right. So the Saudi family got so frightened, they said, look, we will give you all the money you want to build all the mosques you want all over the world as long as you leave the Saudi family alone. And that is when all these mosques started blossoming. Um, uh, I do want to just go back for a second to uh, Hassan uh, Shalgoumi, who, as I said before, uh, uh, stood behind uh, Sarkozy against the burqa. His house was vandalized. Um, and his closeness to the Jews has uh, enraged uh, everybody. So there are voices that are trying to be heard, voices of important people. However, they are living in fear. And Absolutely. that is what is stopping the average person who cannot afford to have bodyguards. That's, that was my point when I was speaking with you. What would they do, ask that modern, moderate Muslim? What would they have to do with you? If they did not perform jihad, if a war broke out, it's the death penalty for them for disobeying. The other thing about the burqa, according to Islamic, true Islamic law, if there's such a thing, it's kind of like some moron, um, <laughs> is that there is no burqa. Okay, the proper dress, 
all it requires you to do is to wear a hijab, a scarf, right, that covers down below. It's almost like a three-piece uh, outfit that the tradition, the real tradition little thing. One is almost like a cap where you cover your, your, your hair, and then it's another piece that comes down um, below the bust line, so the cleavage and breast are covered, and it then there's the third piece. It's like a coat that goes on top of the clothes, and it has to cover to the hands and the feet. But the face, the hands, and the feet can be exposed. Now, your extremist, or that's why I said we do this fashion show called All Veils Aren't Created Equal, because yesterday it was kind of a hilarious, I was at, at the mall and I saw this young girl and she was covered, she had a hijab, she had a, a cover on her hair, but yet she had on, um, what are they called? Oh, I wear them, those really, really tight Leggings, okay, leggings, a short skirt that was see-through, and her top was see-through, but she had the hijab on. I thought, <laughs> that didn't make any sense at all, you know? Because uh, you know, if you're gonna do it, do it right. That's why I feel, you know, if you're gonna, but so it, it's really crazy because you'll see all kinds of variations, which confuses a lot of people. I never wore, like I said, I never even saw this until after I came out of Islam, but I did cover. And I did have some pretty hijabs, too, really pretty. And if I want to do it, I'm going to do it pretty, okay? You know, I want to foo-foo it. But, um, but anyway, that's the actually tradition, is that the hands can be seen. But, but then when you get to these e extreme guys who go crazy, you know, then that's a more tradition, not actual, if there is such a thing as true Islam. Yes. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you for uh, speaking to us tonight. Thank you for inviting me. Thank uh, you so much. It's been very interesting. Um, and I go back to your statement, we need to get the word out. Exactly. And Act for America is one way and your speaking is right. another. Invite me to speak. Bring I, me out. I have a, a son that I debate these issues with. Yes. But uh, unfortunately, I'm old and I probably will forget half the things you said tonight. <laughs> I think it's being taped. <laughs> and, and can I get a tape? I, I'm pretty sure. It's being is that possible? Yes, it, it is. He, you'll you'll he, edit you out? <laughs> I hear you. Okay. <laughs> but anyway, anyways, I, I would like to, we're going to go see him in Atlanta. And, uh, and he it, would listen to this. Yes. It, but it, he would also research you. Absolutely, you and need to. I, he's, he's a person that just doesn't take it at face value. And that's very good. And he hates somebody putting out misinformation. Me too. And telling lies. And, uh, and he will, I'll make a statement just to test him to find out whether it's the truth. Because I don't know whether it's the truth. Right. And he'll send me seven links that shows me that it's a lie. <laughs> right. And see, that's what I'm saying. It's very important that, that we're, we're not misinformed. That we do know really what Islam, what Islam really does teach. The difference between what Islam, the Quran, and the Hadith. And, and see, that is a whole nother mess within itself because the Hadith, depending on who translated it and who approved it, because you've got certain levels of that and that's how you get all these battles because nobody really agrees between the Shiite and the Sunni and the Sufi you know which which Quran verse is correct and which Hadith verse is correct and that's how they can sweep all this and then of course this got abrogated and that got changed and so it's just really confusing so but yes yes uh, I just wanted to know after how many years of marriage the abuse started? That's the, the first question. Uh, it started when we were dating, actually. I'm the crazy person. All right. But I'll never do it again. And so here comes the diamond ring. You were, you're like, you were brought up in a free country, you know, and you don't believe in abuse, like in the abuse idea. Why you kept up with it? Because, you know what? It got crazy, and I'm telling you, seriously. I didn't even realize, because, because you've got the other extreme, you've got the girls who've been abused all their lives and know nothing but abuse and, and relate that to love, which is crazy. And then you've got the women like myself, I never saw abuse, so I didn't understand it. And so when he would tell me, um, it wasn't like it was an every weekend bra, okay, you know, where he'd beat the heck out of me. Um, 
but he kept telling me, I'll never do it again, forgive me. You know, just don't do this again and I'll never do. So, and being in love, I was deaf, dumb, and stupid, okay? And I believed him because I loved him. I, I wanted to think the best of him. I was 28 when we met. We dated a year, so 29. And then we had children. We, had, we ended up making lots of money. We, we had 22 furniture stores. We were making about 100 dollars to $150,000 a month. That's a lot to give up, you know? And then when he beats the heck out of me and he brings home a nine carat tennis bracelet, I, you know, kind of weigh out the odds here. <laughs> All right. where, where I came from. If you, if like, if if you are Muslim and you leave Islam, or if you are a like Christian, convert to Islam and go back to Christian again, yes, you, you gotta die, you know. Oh, hun so, honey, I, I could, if I went to Syria, I'd be dead in a minute. I actually converted in Syria, in Damascus, in the Umayyad Mosque, in front of an imam during the month of Ramadan. That's pretty serious. That's very serious. Yeah. So I mean, I am a documented converted. Convert. It's like very I'm on apostates of Islam on one of their websites. Very fast. How how do you react to this? I've learned a long time ago not to walk in fear, because let me tell you this, and this is a key point about Islam. Their biggest weapon is fear. Fear. If you ha if you're afraid of anything, you have put yourself into the worst bondage. I don't know, but by the grace of God, I overcame fear. I have a Chihuahua story that I talk about, and I know we're really getting, getting out of time here, but just, just bear with me this story, and then this may help your answer and maybe help some of you also overcome fear. I was at one point so fearful of Muhammad because in Islam, you can't look in the eye. So for all these 15 years, I, I was brought up, to look people in the eye. My mom said, if you're lying, you don't look in the eye. You know, so I was popped, my parents did spank. But they, you know, popped if I didn't look in the eye. Then I marry Muhammad, and I can look in the eye. So I'm having to redo my brain here. So it was one of our first court hearings. The judge, he knew I was an abused victim. He knew my story was truth. Because every time Muhammad would speak, now I'd already been separated from him for almost five years. But every time he would speak, I would go literally in the courtroom into a fetal position. And I'm, you know, I had a lot of accomplishments before I met Muhammad. It's not like I'm a shy, withdrawn person. I don't know if you've noticed that or not. Woman, okay, you know, so it's not like I'm timid. And, but every time he would speak to me in the courtroom, I, and I didn't even know I was doing it. I would literally get really and I wouldn't look at him, and I would start bending over. And the judge would say, can you speak into the mic? And I would try to get up into the mic and speak. It's a spirit. I mean, it's I'm box. telling you, this is already after I've left Islam, left Muhammad, been separated from him, going through a divorce. Okay, so my attorney comes to me, and she said, the judge says he believes your story. He knows you're abused. Do you know what you're doing in the courtroom every time he speaks? So the next time in the courtroom, you know, you may think I'm kooky here, okay? But I really hear God's voice. And God saying to me, look at him. Because the only way to overcome a fear is to face a fear. And if anybody can hold you into bondage under that fear, then they've got you. They can control every move you make. So, I, you know, I'm aggravated. How can this guy hold me in fear like this? You know, I mean, they've been gone. I'm free. How can it happen? So... I'm in a courtroom, and, and anyway in a courtroom, you don't really like to look at the person that you're in the courtroom with in their face. So I did. Man, I looked at him. Dead on look at him. Because I'm going to beat this. This is not going to beat me. And I look at him. And I heard God say in my head, he's not a bear. And I went, he's not? <laughs> I really, in my mind, he was a bear. I was afraid to leave for many years because he threatened me. He shamed, he would use shame, he would use guilt, he would use threats, he was gonna take the kids, he would kill my family, he would do something to me, he'd throw me on the streets, all these things. So I'm looking at him straight in the eye. I hear this voice saying, he's not a bear. I was shocked to know he wasn't a bear. So I kinda asked my mind, then what is he? And I heard my mind's voice say, 
the Chihuahua. <laughs> Nipping at your heels. And you see, that's what fear is. It's false evidence appearing real.